Okay guys, we are now moving on to part two of Rome, in which we are going to be talking about the Roman Empire, and in all honesty, it really isn't all about Caesar. So, when we last left Rome, the Republic was great, and they were expanding, and we go back to the problem of the wealthy versus the not wealthy. You see, now you have a bunch of conquered land, and what ended up happening is that the wealthy people were being given this land by the Republic. And then they were charging rent of the conquered people. And as a result, they were getting more money, which gave them more ability. They then created these things called latifundia, which we're going to talk about later, which were basically huge plantations dedicated to cash crops, which the Roman world had never really seen before. And they used lots of slaves. It was actually believed that 1.13 of all Romans were slaves. But because they had so many crops, they could charge less for their crops, and they actually ran out the small farmers and bought them out. And as a result, you had a large group of people that were really becoming homeless, and the gap between the poor and the wealthy was growing. Now, there were some attempts at reform. The most famous were the two tribunes called the Gracchi, Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus, who were trying to, through the assembly, do things like redistributing land to commoners when it was conquered, um, create max holding laws. In other words, you can only have a lot of fundia that is so big um, to seize extra land and, again, give that to the poor. And it resulted in both of them getting killed. In both 132 and 121, they were basically uh, both assassinated. And the tensions are rising and rising. And what's starting to happen is that people were really losing faith in the Senate. Now, not only were they losing faith in the Senate, the Senate actually did something to weaken itself. Now, again, the Assembly passes the law, the consuls run everything, but the Senate is really in charge of everything. And in order to, I guess you could say, save money, what the Senate initially did was that when generals conquered areas for Rome, they actually got to distribute the land and keep much of the wealth for, for themselves. The trade-off for the Senate is that they would eventually collect taxes. Well, what that ended up doing is that it got the generals a lot of power and the soldiers started becoming more loyal to the generals than the actual republic. Not surprisingly, what this results in is this weakened Senate and we end up having a civil war. And the two main guys that fought the Civil War were Gaius Marius and Lucius Cornelius Sulla. Sulla is on the bottom right there. Um, they had a short Civil War, and by 85 BCE, Marius was able to um, gain the upper hand and kill a lot of the rivals to him and his power. Sulla, luckily enough for him, actually escapes now. Marius starts to establish his power, but he dies. He dies kind of a regular death, but he dies. Unfortunately, that then allows Sulla to come and take power. And what Sulla did was basically a reign of terror. If anybody was going to get in his way, he had them killed. He then created these things called lists, which it was almost like a free-for-all of like, okay, so here's the deal, guys. If you want to... I'm going to put a list of these people out, and if you can, just go kill them. Uh, it was absolutely crazy, and uh, oddly enough, a man by the name of Julius Caesar was put on that list that people begged to set free, and he would. But he ends up killing tens of thousands of people, and Sulla was a guy who was from the upper class, and he allowed people to spend as much money, he focused everything on the wealthy, and poverty with regular people was basically growing. Then Sulla dies. And by 70, the Republic is back, but it's very much weakened. However, during all of that, there comes a man from the Julian family, a guy by the name of Julius Caesar, who is an incredible general and is going to go on a run that was really unprecedented in Roman history. The most important thing you need to understand about Julius Caesar, and his full name is actually Gaius Julius Caesar, 
is that he conqu conquers Gaul. You see this area here, and Gaul consists of the modern-day countries of France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and a chunk of Germany, which allowed to get them huge amount of natural resources and people. This is perhaps the biggest gain, single gain of territory of Rome of all time, and it was one of the most important provinces, and it really established or gave Rome the opportunity to become a power that it would be. And that is Caesar's true influence, because the other stuff, the political stuff, he doesn't live really long enough to do it. But from 58 to 50 BCE, he is going to go on this run, and as you can see, he has all these battles here, and it's brutal. It was said that he killed upwards of a million people uh, to do this, but nonetheless, uh, Caesar put himself on the map. He also uh, was able to bring Egypt into the fold. Uh, Egypt was in the middle of a civil war between the pharaoh Ptolemy and his sister Cleopatra. Remember, they're Greeks. And you see Caesar on the left and um, Cleopatra on the right. And Caesar is able to cement an alliance with her. They kill Ptolemy. They establish her as the pharaoh. And he actually also has a son with Cleopatra, the only known child of Caesar, and his name was Caesarian. Now, while he was doing all of this, he also wrote some poetry on the side and fixed a calendar that we use to almost the modern day. Now, Caesar was also an astute politician, and he got together three of his buddies um, to start to circumvent the power of the Senate. Uh, there was Caesar, who was hugely and enormously popular. Why? Well, a lot of the money that he would take, he would give it to regular citizens. He promised to help them get land reforms and all sorts of fun stuff like that. And he would also be named consul one day. They had another friend of theirs, Crassus, who was of great wealth and influence between the equestrian order or the cavalry. So there's your other military power. And then you have Pompey, who was the richest man in Rome, had a great um, reputation, also kind of had this, you know, funky boyish haircut here. And when you put the three of them together, they slowly but surely started circumventing the power of the Senate to put themselves in ultimate power. But it's all going to fall apart. Why? Because Caesar and Pompey just couldn't coexist. Um, Crassus dies while fighting the Parthians. Caesar and Pompey have a falling out. Caesar decides to keep his army, and then he's going to go on the run. Pompey decides to ally with the Senate and declare that Caesar is an outlaw. And boom, you have a four-year civil war. And it kind of waged back and forth on, until you have two key victories at Dorachium and Pharsalus, in which Caesar's forces are able to um, defeat Pompey's forces. Pompey does flee, uh, actually, down to Egypt. However, Egypt, being held by his ally Cleopatra, was able to conquer him, and Pompey was assassinated upon arriving in the Egyptian provinces. And now this paved the way for Caesar to gain control. Now, Caesar really only ruled from 45 to 44 BCE. He had a lot of big-time plans for what he's going to do. Uh, the Senate names him dictator and imperator, which we get the term emperor from. He was going to have policies of allowing... Um, redistribution of land, free food. He actually, in a gesture, steps down as dictator to become a consul, although he owned the army, so that's all that really mattered. But unfortunately, the Senate realized that, oh my God, this guy's going to take all their power, and they decide to kill him. And you had a conspiracy led by um, his friend Brutus, and as he went to the Senate one day, he was attacked by senators. So imagine our president going to, say, the State of the Union and being attacked by, you know, the, uh, the Republicans and the Democrats. That's basically what happened. And Caesar was stabbed 27 times and died. He did not so, say, et tu, Brute. Caesar gave us that. And when you're stabbed 27 times, it's really hard to actually talk. Fun fact, though, Caesar was killed on my brother's birthday, something we used to tease him about and make him cry. It's very wrong, but nonetheless, um, my brother then was, you know, found Caesar to be very, very uh, popular. He was a big fan of him uh, and actually even got the haircut at one point in his life. It was crazy, but still. Now, eventually, the Senate kind of comes back under control, but you start to get alliances 
because the Senate really is falling apart. And basically, Caesar did have an heir, uh, his nephew Octavian. And Octavian allied himself with Mark Antony, Caesar's top general. They also had another guy named Lepidus, who was the third part of what was called the Second Triumvirate, but he got pieced out in like a week, so he doesn't really matter. And basically, they're able to hunt down the conspirators, they track down Brutus and the allies, and at the Battle of uh, Philippi, they capture and they kill everybody. And then over the next couple years, they kind of have an uneasy truce. The most important thing that Octavian does is he makes an alliance with the greatest general in Rome at the time, a man by the name of uh, Marcus Agrippa. Octavian himself is a great politician, but he was a terrible general, and it was known that he would faint and throw up if he had to see a battle. So, hey, if you're really bad like that, why not get a good guy that can be a general for you? And slowly over a period of a few years, he solidifies himself, he strengthens his army, while Mark Antony kind of slides down into Egypt and evidently falls in love with Cleopatra. They start to have a relationship before he realizes Octavian comes after him, and you get another civil war. Uh, unfortunately for Mark Antony, his forces are just sorely overwhelmed, and finally at the great naval battle of Actium, they... Um, they, meaning Antony and Cleopatra, are defeated, they both commit suicide, and now Octavian is in position to rule Rome. Uh, and then the final thing he does to cement his power is he actually uh, orders the murder of his cousin Caesarion. So the only person that could have taken over for him, he has killed. As I said, he wasn't a nice guy, but he was shrewd. And at this point, the Republic is now an empire. The Senate declares Octavian to uh, have a new name. His name is Caesar Augustus. And whereas they do not call him the emperor, he is considered to be the ruler of the main provinces of the empire, and he controls the army. And he will rule from 27 BCE to 14 CE. And the empire is now really going to focus on growth. Uh, he will use the Senate, which people still elect, by the way, as like an advisory thing. So at least early on, people don't really realize what's happening. He creates his own special guard, kind of his own secret service called the Praetorian Guards, which interestingly enough in the future will often have an impact on succession because they tend to kill emperors they don't like. But his most important thing is centralizing law. This is where Octavian is huge, and this is where he influences us, us today. Um, there was a law table called the Twelve Tables of Law created in 450 BCE, which was Rome's first ever law code. And Octavian is going to take that and kind of reshape it into strong centralized Roman law. This law will apply equally to all people. Judges will enforce the law. All people get representation. You have the right to a lawyer. We have this. The concept of innocent until proven guilty, which for the first time in world history is used, we use this. The right to challenge your accuser before the law, we use this. They get rid of old laws that are ineffective, and then when new situations arise, he passes new laws. They use local laws. They also use the concept of precedence. They take into account uh, the situation in which a law occurred, and it is just absolutely incredible. And now you have a well-organized, well-run empire that's ready to expand. And it is this expansion period that we call the Pax Romana, or the Roman peace, that went from 27 BCE to 180 CE. It went from the Emperor Augustus, who of course there on the right is pointing to his victories, and he has some weird angel baby on his leg, don't really know why he's there. And this is uh, to the final Emperor Marcus Aurelius in 180. He's not the final Emperor ever, but the, ever, but the final Emperor of this era. Now, it's not that it was the Roman peace that they didn't um, fight, they were fighting a lot, but they weren't ever beaten. Uh, Rome will get its huge size, they will build cities, many modern day cities, uh, like for instance London and areas of North Africa all throughout Europe are built under this time. The legions are going to be everywhere and Rome will just be absolutely unstoppable. Underneath Augustus they conquer Switzerland and Austria and Slovenia and Armenia and Germany. Um, and parts of Poland and Syria, and that will continue to grow, um, and they really just take over everything. Uh, again, some of those cities, London, Paris, Lyon, Cologne, Toledo, 
um, and you just couldn't stop them. They were too strong. They were too powerful. Um, the army was too good. Uh, the army also became a way that you could advance uh, socially. So I can start at the bottom. I can join the army and rise up. The famous age, uh, Emperor Hadrian was a commoner, and he did that. And Rome just reaches its height. And as you can see here, it's absolutely gigantic, uh, especially for its time. And if you look at some of the names that we still get from today, uh, Belgica, that's modern-day Belgium. We get Britannia for Britain. Okay, you come over here, Sardinia, Corsica. We know that Italia is Italy. Um, you know, the concept of the use of Asia, Syria, it is just unbelievable, and this art, this empire is ready to go. All right, let's get your questions. I'll see you guys tomorrow.